Welcome to the NERI Sim Center's Live Expert Tips, where we feature the capabilities of Sim Center tools through compelling use cases and examples in natural hazards engineering simulations. In this session, we introduce you to surrogate modeling. The application is in the context of statistical representations of surface wind pressures on buildings. Our expert today is Dr. Song Ri Yi. Dr. Yi is a researcher at UC Berkeley where she develops novel methods for sensitivity analysis, multi-fidelity surrogate modeling, and adaptive design of experiments for the Neary Sim Center. She received her PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Seoul National University. Her research interests include probability-based sensitivity analysis, surrogate modeling, structural reliability, and random vibration analysis. Songri, it's nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, today, I will talk about surrogate modeling of surface wind pressure statistics. Um, and I'm Songri Yi, postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley and software developer at the same center. Before I start, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators um, in this project in University of Notre Dame. So um, urban building structures are subjected to various kinds of external threats and strong wind is one of them. And to evaluate the wind risk, we often rely on wind pressure distribution, which can be predicted by either physical experiments or computational simulations. The problem is that both simulations are considered to be expensive, meaning it requires lots of resources and time to get the prediction values. So this motivates the introduction of surrogate modeling, which allows you to obtain this outcome uh, with a very small computational effort once they are trained. So uh, in particular, we are interested in wind interference effect, effects, meaning when two buildings are located adjacent to each other, uh, pressure, surface pressure pattern at one building is perturbed by location of uh, the presence of another building. So it gets harder to predict um, the pressure pattern. So the goal of this work is to develop a surrogate model that can reproduce the wind tunnel test results, which were um, concerning the interference effect. Uh, the training data set we used was to, uh, from Tokyo Polytech University Aerodynamic Database. This is a public database that's available to everyone. Uh, and in this database, um, the experimental setting was that there is a building model located um, and there are sensors across the building surface, which we call pressure taps. They measure the pressure time history and they locate another building nearby the target building, which will create some interference effect. And they repeated this experiments for different building arrangement. Here it the uh, points in black dot represents the possible locations of interfering buildings that they investigated. And the blue one is the target building of interest. And also they repeated this for different wind angle direct wind directions. And also they changed the height of interfering building so that they can investigate how high it affects the pressure distribution. And in terms of experimental outcome, they measured pressure time history at each pressure tab locations. And often we are interested in, um, instead of entire time history, we are interested in average statistics across the time history, like the mean, what was the mean value or what was the peak value or the variance. So if we every, uh, for example, if we are interested in average pressure time history, we obtain average time history for each of pressure type locations, and we can visualize the result in this way. So here it really represents how the wind mean pressure is distributed across the wind surface. So in this kind of setting, we have input dimension of four representing different configurations. We say four because building representing building arrangement requires two parameters, X and Y coordinate. And our output of interest have dimension of 252 representing each pressure tab locations. And this uh, result that we can get from 
wind tunnel experiment, we want to reproduce those using a surrogate model. And uh, as a side note, they have uh, repeated this ex experiment for 8,500 times, representing different arrays, like configurations of these four parameters. So um, I will briefly review what is surrogate model uh, only for those who are not familiar with it. So when we have a system model, like complex system model that lo takes long time to perform an experiment, and if we need to repeat this multiple times, for example, for risk analysis or for design decisions, that we don't want to repeat this uh, so many times naively. Instead, we want to repeat this for only several times. Like we want to perform experiments, computational or physical experiments several uh, times and collect the data set and represent those data in this space of input and output variable. Um, and then we want to interpolate this data set so that when you want to get the response for a new configuration, like new experimental configuration, instead of running actual physical computational simulations, we want to uh, interpolate the existing data set and read the value instantly, uh, instantaneously. And there are different ways of creating this kind of reg regression model, which we call surrogate model, and we choose Gaussian process model in this work. Um, and also for those who are not very familiar with Gaussian process model, I have one page summary. So in Gaussian process modeling approach, we assume that this kind of regression surface is represented as a Gaussian process model, meaning any points located in this surface are jointly Gaussian. That means there are some kind of mean and variance that represents their relationship. An important thing here is that the co correla correlation between the points are assumed to be depend on the distance between two points. That means if two points are located far away from each other, they will have low correlation, meaning their response will be different or can be different. But when their points are close to each other, then we expect there will be high correlation, meaning their response is very likely to be similar. Based on this assumption, um, when we don't have any observation data, there can be lots of possibilities of the function shape. But as we obtain more and more training data sets from experiments, we can have better idea on the domain where the uh, where it is close to the observation points. And as we get more and more data sets, we get better and better prediction across the entire domain. And all of this is thanks to our correlation assumption. Um, and in this entire process, there is a very important parameter, um, which is this data here, which uh, represents how fast the correlation decays as the distance between two points increases. So calibrating this parameter is takes the major part in training process of the Gaussian process model. And this is important because we are um, concerning high dimensional output. So when we try to naively apply this Gaussian process model to our problem, we face, um, we realize that we have high dimensional outcome and because our outcome dimension is 252. And because of that, um, there are different ways to handle this. So first one, we can create 252 independent surrogate models representing each of the pressure tab um, outcomes. But this can be um, uh, resource intensive because it means we are calibrating those like correlation parameters 252 times. So it's just not um, ideal. So another approach we can take is to create 252 surrogate models, but assuming that they're, they share the exact same the correlation parameters. In that way, we are constraining the parameters, but um, we need to calibrate only a single set of those parameters. So practically the computational cost is the same as creating a single surrogate model in this case. 
However, it may restrict the flexibility of your uh, model prediction. So what we chose as an alternative is to introduce the output dimension reduction technique so that we can deal with less than 250 <laughs> dimension and repeat this calibration or training of surrogate for only the reduced number of outputs. Um, and for the output dimension method, reduction method, we chose principal component analysis, meaning um, uh, if you are, uh, so the principal component analysis reduce the output dimension relying on similarity in the output response. That means if you have two points located on the building surface um, representing pressure depths, then um, the response from these two pressure tabs will be very similar whenever you repeat the experiments. Um, so if you re uh, visualize those data set in these two dimension scatter plot, X representing the response at the first pressure tab location and X two, uh, Y axis representing the response at the second pressure tab locations, their uh, response will always be near diagonal line, meaning the response will be very similar. So in that case, we can condense the information by saying that the first pressure, um, if you know the response at the second pressure time location, then you will um, can estimate the locate uh, the pressure at the first pressure tab location. So this is just the way it uh, the PCA reduces the dimension um, of output, and you can extend this concept into higher dimension output, like in our case. So as a result, uh, we were able to reduce the original dimension of 252 into 23 uh, number of dimensions. And Based on this, our surrogate model training process has two-step approach. First, uh, to select the training set, we select the subset of our entire TPU database, um, which was uh, 500 experiments. And we have input dimension of four, output dimension of 252. So using these 500 training samples, we were able to perform dimension reduction and reduce the uh, output dimension to 23, as we discussed in the previous slides. And with this, we create a surrogate model that can create the, uh, we create a surrogate model that can predict the uh, latent variable, which is the reduced uh, outcome variable. And whenever new, we want to predict the outcome for a new experimental configurations, we can um, predict, first predict the latent variable and then reconstruct this original spatial pattern. And this is a straightforward because we use principal component analysis as our dimension reduction technique. And we use COFM to train the surrogate model. And this is just a uh, small details on how Gaussian process model is performed. We have four input variables, and these are the domain of interest. Um, and one um, small detail was that the wind direction is in fact a periodic variable, meaning the response at around the, when the wind direction is zero degree will be similar to the response when res uh, the wind direction is around 360 degree. So we didn't want to lose this correlation information. So we introduced periodic kernel, which can account for such periodicity. And to do this, we need to make a small modification in the COFM backend, but everything was written in Python script. So I, I believe this is kind of straightforward for um, anyone who uses the COFM. So this is the first set of results. We are showing here the result of 500 um, training, uh, result from 500 training data set that are randomly selected from the entire uh, experimental database. And remaining 8,000 samples are used as the test samples. And here we are visualizing the 
validation verification result, why exists this root mean scare error between the original response and the predicted response. And we are just projecting this across the wind directions to see if there is any obvious trend that we can observe um, in terms of the errors. But here it shows that error is relatively constant and compared to the um, other method we have implemented, we saw that the accuracy is higher. But more interesting thing we observe is when we change the verification measure. So previously we were using root mean square error measure, meaning we are measuring difference between the experimental result and surrogate prediction as an absolute difference. However, um, when we change our verification measure to the correlation across the each pressure applications, then we are kind of switching our focus to see how the similar the spatial patterns are between um, the original response and the predicted response. And if we do that, we start to see that there are a domain where surrogate is not doing a good job in their prediction. So if we see what are the actual cases we see in this area, um, the right side figure here shows the um, uh, like four of these data points, uh, representative data points, when correlation um, verification measure shows high value, like maybe the points is located around here, then we see that spatial patterns are very well captured. But in case when correlation question uh, verification measures show low value, for example, in this case is this point here, we see that it is not doing a good job in predicting the spatial patterns. However, because their absolute amplitude of the pressure um, value itself is very low, this difference was not captured in the root mean square error measure. So, um, so we investigated in detail why this is happening. So we, we tried to identify the domain with the low accuracy. And we found that that's the case when we have wind direction smaller than 50 degree and building distance uh, when the distance of two buildings, the target building and interfering buildings are close to each other. And thinking of our experimental configuration, the wind direction smaller than 50 degree is exactly the part where building interf wind interference effect occurs. And especially those are higher when the building distance is smaller. And this really means that when there is interference, surrogate is struggling to predict the um, spatial pattern. And this can be observed when we investigate specific cases, like when there is wind direction, horizontal direction, then if building is aligned, the interfering building is aligned in the same direction, then we get larger decay in the accuracy. And when wind direction is diagonal, we again see a larger decay in the diagonal um, when interference building is located diagonally. On the other hand, when the wind direction is orthogonal to building alignment, then um, there is no interference effect taking place in this experiment. So in that case, Sergei was able to do a very good job in predicting the wind pressure pattern. So that case was kind of trivial. So it the, this kind of investigation really tells you that it's harder to predict when there is interference effect, and therefore we want to place more samples for the higher interference domain, meaning we want to perform more experiments with the configuration that is likely to have interference um, uh, effect in the response. And this can be done either through our engineering insight, we can um, intentionally put more samples around that domain, but also we can rely on our algorithmic um, search approach to automatically obtain those desired uh, situation. So, um, and that is done through so-called design, adaptive design of experiments, meaning we are trying to add training data sets sequentially so that um, it maximizes its information. Um, so consider the case where you have 
these five um, trainings that are already at hand and you want to add more data, more training data set to improve your surrogate model. Then where would you want to put your training samples? The first approach you can take is to find the domain with high variance so that you can place samples here and significantly reduce the variance around these points. But there's another approach you can take, which is to select the high bias domain, meaning if there is the domain where you expect high difference between the prediction, surrogate prediction, and the exact response, then you want to locate more samples around that area. And this is usually done through so-called cross, uh, live on out cross validation error measure. And that means you want to remove each training point sequentially. For example, if you remove these points and try to predict this response using only this five training data set, it will be hard to, uh, there will be large error observed. And that kind of indicates us that there is something interesting going on around this domain. So we need to investigate this domain by putting more training samples. So in this way, uh, so this, Searching for high byte as domain is the key aspect in our uh, surrogate um, application. And this is just previous result that shows that as number of training data set increases, the error of surrogate model will decrease. But if you introduce this kind of adaptive DOE scheme within the same number of training data set, your error measure can significantly decrease. Um, and using this approach, we can make our um, we can automate our surrogate training algorithm so that it selects more data training data points from the high uh, wind interference effect domain. And here I'm showing the result of adaptive design of experiments. Now we select only 150 randomly sampled uh, experiments and we will add more 450 experiments adaptively to train the surrogate. And again, the remaining data samples in our database will use, be used for validation, verification of the surrogate model. And we did try for different configuration, and this is one of the nice results we obtained. And um, here we are comparing the result from the previous previous result from the random sampling approach and the adaptive design of experiment approach. And we see that the problematic domain um, accuracy at this domain has been uh, improved significantly, and we didn't lose anything in terms of root mean square error as well. Um, and there can be different strategies to incorporate this adaptive design of experiment. For example, you can aim to minimize the error across entire um, sample domain of interest. And here, this is just showing one result from that. And um, here I'm visualizing the worst prediction cases to show you, give you a better idea on how our surrogate is performing. So the worst correlation case will be sample around wind direction of 50, um, and the worst RMSC is again around this point. Um, and we see that even in the worst case scenario, it was doing a pretty good job in identifying the spatial patterns. And another adaptive DOE strategy can be trying to minimize the peak error, the maximum error across the entire domain, and we get a slightly decayed performance, but still worst case scenario shows that it's doing a pretty good job in predicting the uh, wind pressure pattern. And we wanted to investigate the domain, actual domain that uh, our algorithm, the actual training samples that our algorithm chose, chose so we have four uh, dimensions. So we are protecting these training samples into two of our uh, parameter input parameters. So first is wind direction, and second is interfering building direction, meaning angle between the target and the interfering building. And we can see that more training samples are located, like more experiments are performed uh, for the cases where wind direction and the building direction was aligning with each other, which basically is high, high, high interference domain. And then 
it also located more samples in the boundary part because it's harder to predict the uh, those extreme cases. Um, and then we uh, tried uh, different configurations, like different objective functions for design of experiments. Uh, when we try to minimize RMSC, we see a better performance in terms of like RMSC. And if we try to maximize correlation um, instead, then we see better um, improvement accuracy in terms of correlation. So the result can vary depending on how you select your objective function. De uh, details of your objective function for this kind of adaptive design of experiments. And finally, we applied this statistic, this uh, the exact same approach to other statistics. For example, we apply this to predict standard deviation uh, pattern along the building surface. And we see that the accuracy is lower because of the sampling variability, higher sampling variability in the standard deviation. But compared to random sampling, we still have significant improvement. And this shows the worst case scenario we obtained um, And then we again apply this to predict positive peak as well as the negative peak. But here I wanted to remark that this is not the sample observation of the peak values, but we did some internal um, stochastic averaging technique to stabilize the prediction. So we are basically predicting mean of positive peak across all, along some duration. So that's why we see smaller uh, sample variability in this prediction. So without such sample variability, we do a very good job in predicting those mean peak values. So as a summary in this presentation, I want to show you that the surrogate model can repro reproduce the wind tunnel experimental death data set, especially under the wind interference effect. And to do this, we combine some dimension reduction method to um, make this computationally affordable. And also we introduce some adaptive design of experiments to increase, improve the accuracy with the same number of training samples. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation for today's live expert tip. And I just want to mention that there will be more live expert tips coming on May, and there are some in-person Sim Center events for those who are interested in to join. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Songwee. Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, for this really interesting work. Um, there are a few questions uh, in the chat uh, that I'd like to share with you. Um, one is um, rather straightforward. What were the inputs to the surrogate model? You trained the in, you trained this model. Uh, what did you use as inputs to get the resulting um, uh, pressure distributions? Uh, yes. So we have four. Uh, uh, so our input dimension is four. First is let me. This better shows that. So, so the first, uh, so we need input related to that represent building arrangement. Here you can choose to use x and y coordinate, but we choose to use a uh, building distance and the angle of this interfering building. So that makes it makes two input uh variables, and then additional input was wind direction. So this experiment was performed. Uh, multiple times for different wind directions. So there was another input. And the third input was height of interference building. So they again per repeated this experiment for five different heights. So um, summing up all of them, we have four uh, input variables. Okay. How long does it take to train a surrogate model of this size? Uh, so we had 500 data set and um, with design of experiment, I think it took like two hours, but I, I'm not really sure I cannot recall exactly. Okay. Um, when you sample the wind direction and pressure, um, oops, that one went away. Is the randomness related to time or is it just one value per sample? 
So I think you're looking at a time history, correct? Yes. Sir, can you repeat the uh, question? Yeah. Uh, when you sample the wind direction and pressure, is the randomness related to time or is it just one value per sample? So maybe you can explain this pressure time history and how you go from uh, the time history of a single pressure tap um, to your mean pressure coefficient. Uh, yes, so in, pre in each pressure tap, we record the entire time history. So, um, so our raw data set is time history, so we take average of these sample points to obtain the temporal mean value that we use for training as well as test the surrogate. But while doing so, um, because we rely on sample average, um, there can be some um, noise in the data set. So this average value is not like um, deterministic given these four parameters, although the um, level of noise is very small because we have lots of data set, but still we do have some variability in our uh, prediction. So that's uh, part of the reason. And, and this variability is higher for the standard deviation compared to mean. So that's part of the reason that the accuracy of standard deviation was lower. So meaning there's inherent randomness in the test data set as well as training data sets that cannot be predicted using the surrogate model. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, application of your surrogate model, in terms of using it, is it focused on interpolating within the range of, of the experiments or is it extrapolation of geometries or building arrangements? And I'm not sure if that is clear or not, but. Yes, yes. So um, it's it's on interpolation because for any surrogate model, we struggle on the extrapolation. So it's important to first design the experiment so that it covers wide range of the domain of interest, so that it doesn't interpolate. It it doesn't need to interpolate outside of what was the um, experimental setting. So um, the short answer is it can perform extrapolation, uh, in, in interpolation. If you try to extrapolate it, um, I'm sure it will um, do a very bad job in the prediction. Okay. Um, but, another question yeah. is, um, the, on generating samples of pressure time histories, using surrogates for dynamic analysis. Is it, are you feeling that it is possible to generate samples of pressure time histories using surrogates? Or maybe is it just the application of um, taking this temporal mean and applying it in, in maybe a more um, consolidated coefficient? Would it be able, uh, I guess the question is, does the, is the surrogate able to come up with time histories or not? Um, that's a tricky question because I, uh, so first of all, in order to predict the pressure time history, that means you will give press, uh, input value In, like inflow of the wind, like wind velocity as also the input of the surrogate model. And then makes the surrogate model deal with high dimension input problem as well, because input doesn't need to be time history. And the problem of high dimensionality in general surrogate concept is that it will require lots and lots of data set to make any predictions. So. I believe if you use techniques like neural network and if you have a lot of data points or you have um, lots of experiment, computational or physical experimental data sets, then it may be feasible. I, I don't have experience on that, so I cannot tell. Um, but, 
but conceptually, uh, I imagine it will require lots of data sets. So probably it's not really applicable um, in, in especially in cases where the sim simulation model is very expensive. Okay, I'm gonna change the, the topic over to your adaptive design of experiments. Uh, it's really interesting, um, a really interesting use or, or capability. Uh, you showed a plot where there were um, points where the adaptive design of experiments selected um, values. Was the placement of those points automatic from the design of experiments or you chose those? You said it was important that boundaries uh, are, are chosen. Did you select boundaries because you know they're important or was the adaptive design of experiments providing that? Um, it was the adaptive design of experiments, um, especially because uh, adaptive, the algorithm we chose uses both variance and bias. Um, and first of all, the boundary part have high variance um, only because there's no sample located like across the bias. So it just tends to have high variance around the boundary. So it locates, it tends to look in more samples around the boundary domain. So that could be one reason, but we found that it's putting more samples than what I would expect. So um, I assume it detected some high bias in the boundary region as well. So the short answer is it, it's purely based on algorithmic choices. I, I didn't um, put any physical intuition in selecting these points. Okay. Um, and what algorithm or what tool did you use for the adaptive design of experiments? Um, at the time when I was performing this adaptive design of experiments, I used my own um, the code I wrote, but currently CoFem also supports the adaptive design of experiments capability. So it will be a nice way of testing CoFem. Um, if you have this kind of problem, you might want to try CoFem um, to perform adaptive DOE as well. Okay, great. Well, um, I want to thank you for answering, answering our questions. Thank you to the attendees for um, sharing those questions. Um, thanks for joining us here live. Uh, I want to remind viewers that you can register for some of our live events on our webpage, which is simcenter.designsafe-ci.org. This concludes the recorded portion of today's live expert tips with the Neary Sim Center. We hope you've been inspired by this research and see opportunities for adapting or expanding the capabilities to your own work. Thank you very much, Songri. Thank you, man. Thank you, everyone.